Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending the Bay Area Older Adults Internet Security Seminar. So my name is Dr. Ann Ferguson, and I am Executive Director of Bay Area Older Adults, <clears throat> which we call BAO for short. We're a nonprofit organization that improves the health and well being of more than 65,000 adults age 50 plus each year. And we do things like trek on nature trails, learn about different cultures, explore historic sites, and help connect you to people with shared interests. And since 2013, we've taken more than 11,000 older adults who have walked nearly 36,000 miles in more than 50 parks and preserves. So before we begin the seminar, I wanna remind you that this presentation provides recommendations and helpful tips. And it's for informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for professional technical advice. And you are responsible for any consequences of actions taken on the basis of the information provided in this seminar. So the plan for today is shown in this outline. So I'm going to give you some background so we're all on the same page. And we'll cover what you can do to stay safe when you use the internet for web browsing and email. And then I'm going to also share some resources. So first, a little background. So let's start with some basic information about the internet and terms used so that we're all speaking the same language. So device, device could be a computer, a tablet, a cell or smartphone. The internet, that's the infrastructure that connects devices all over the world. You might've heard this term IP address that stands for internet protocol address. And it's basically a number assigned to each device um, that's used to allow the devices to communicate among each other. The World Wide Web, usually people just call it the web. That's the way we access information over the internet. A web server is hardware and software that helps to deliver the web content. And content would be examples, email and web pages. And then ISP, you've probably heard of that acronym, that's internet service provider. So that's who you pay to give you the internet service. Uh, the two most popular companies are AT&T and Xfinity. So now let's explain some things that can harm you and your device. So malware. So that term comes from malicious software. It takes the first three letters of malicious and the last four letters of software. And basically those are software programs or apps used for malicious intent. So typically these are downloaded by clicking on a link in an email by clicking on an online advertisement or going to a malicious website that you don't realize is a malicious website. And especially nowadays, you'll probably heard of some examples where some famous companies like an automobile company was being hacked. And so it looked like you were on the right site, but you were actually on a site that was managed by a hacker. So examples of malware are viruses, Trojans, worms, and one in particular I want to talk to you about is spyware. So that's a type of malware as well. And that's advertising software that gathers data about your online behavior and or tracks you. And that typically you get that because it's secretly bundled as part of a free software download or it's obtained by visiting websites. And the common types of spyware are adware, and cookies. The last term is hacker. And that's a person who designs and or uses malware to gain unauthorized access to your device in order to get information like your banking password to get access to your bank account and or cause damage like hold your device for ransom. 
Now, I want to mention that the state of California has done a great thing. It's decided to follow the European GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation that protects digital privacy of citizens of the EU. So we've got some protection here in California. So they passed and implemented a law called the Consumer Privacy Act in 2020. While it's the strictest data privacy law in the United States, it is limited to very large companies or companies selling a lot of consumer data. And you've probably noticed that when you go to websites these days, you can now choose not to sell your personal information and choose privacy and cookie settings. So even though this law is in place and these practices have been implemented, keep in mind selling consumer data or using it for other purposes is still a greater than $10 billion industry. So with that perspective, let's continue with some more terms and explanations. So what makes up your device? So your device is hardware, which is the physical equipment you purchased. And then the operating system or OS, that's the program that runs basic functions on your device, including external devices like a printer, a keyboard, a mouse, an external monitor, or even an external hard drive. And it controls the ability to run other software programs or apps. So examples of operating systems, if you have a Mac, it's the Mac OS. And if you have a PC, it would either be Windows or Android, depending on the type of computer you bought or smartphone. So there's a, this term has gained popularity. I guess they like switching terms, but basically apps, people are talking about apps now. And basically they're software or programs installed on your computer. So just a new term for something that's old. So examples of apps are Microsoft Office, which has Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. Security software that you might have. McAfee is a popular, common software that people have heard about that's security software. Adobe Reader. Website browsers like Mozilla Firefox. Google Chrome. Microsoft Edge. And for Macs, Safari. Now let's cover how to keep your device updated. I'm going to focus on computers since they're more complex, but other devices are similar. So let's start with a question about the operating system. What is the most important reason to update the operating system? Is it user interface looks better? Is it it's free? Is it it keeps the hardware from failing or is it fixing bugs? So the correct answer is that it fixes bugs that make the device vulnerable to malware. So when developers at different companies build software, inevitably humans aren't perfect. There are bugs or program errors. And these errors can make your device vulnerable to malware like spyware and or hackers. And this is the reason they release patches, updates, and new versions. So you can use these links shown here to learn about how to set up automatic operating system updates. So that's one software you want to update on a regular basis, the operating system. So this is for the operating system. Very important to set up automatic OS updates. So you don't have to remember to do it manually. Well, what about your apps? We well, you also want to set up automatic updates for your apps. Now, the nice thing is that the common internet browsers, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari are set to automatically update by default. Um, they may offer you to install beta versions, uh, but since those are test versions, they're going to have more bugs than the final software release. So I don't advise testing out the beta version unless you're super experienced. 
Now you may get a notice or alert about updating your app that pops up on your computer. Um, if you see this, you wanna be really careful. Uh, make sure that it's a real update. So if you happen to be on the internet when this happens, close your browser completely and see if the alert disappears. If so, it's likely not a real update and it's coming from a malicious website. Ask yourself, is this software that popped up that needs to be updated even on your computer? If not, ignore the pop-up message and as soon as you can, scan your device with security software because this may mean you have malware on your device. Another thing you can do if you have the software on your computer is rather than assume that this pop-up is real. I mean, if you've seen it before and you know it's really coming from, say, a Microsoft update, but it's something you haven't seen, you can just go directly to the website of the company that makes the software and check if there are really updates available, and you can download them directly from their website. You can also check the latest internet scams. Um, so I'm going to give you some resources for where to look for the latest internet scams. And usually when I see something that looks suspicious and I go search on any of those websites, it'll pick it up and then I'll know, oh, okay, this is um, a hacker or people who are trying to do bad things. And so I can just ignore it. If when you want to download new software, you can check out the safety of the app. Um, one site that's really helpful is CNET because they have a lot of software to download. Um, and you don't have to download it from that site, but what's nice is you can search for the software you're thinking of downloading and you'll notice that they do a review of the software. So number one, you can see here in the red box, first red box, last updated. 1822. Okay, so that was kind of recently. You want to make sure like the software gets updated um, on a regular basis because obviously updates mean it's more secure. And then it'll even mention whether it has any issues with viruses because some there is some malicious software. So you can check that and if you've got a thumbs up, that means it's good. Then you can also look at the pros and cons of the software and what they say is the final verdict. You know, is it worthwhile downloading? Um, now when you're installing a new app, make sure you read all the instructions. This happened to me before. Um, you want to uncheck any boxes. I remember once I just was installing it really quickly. That was my bad. And I didn't uncheck the box and I ended up downloading this other software that was bundled with it. And boy, did I have a hassle like uninstalling everything to get rid of it. So just make sure you go through the steps slowly, carefully uncheck any boxes to avoid installing another app that's bundled with that app that could be malicious. And then check the privacy policies so that you're actively deciding whether you want to install that software. So our next topic is browser settings and online behavior. So first I want to explain the term cache. So in regular English, cache means secret storage. In the case of your browser, the browser stores the information about what websites you visit and what you do on the websites. And it stores it in the cache. The security issue is that it stores all the information you added to an online form, like your address and email, as well as your password and other personal information. One way to keep companies from check, tracking you with spyware and getting this information is to set your browser to automatically clear cache, cookies, and history when you close your browser. And so what I've given you is a link to a video I made just for this seminar that is a short step-by-step -step video it shows you how to set up your browser to clear your cache every time you close your browser so that once you set it up, you have to actually do the behavior associated with that, which is when you do one thing on the browser, like check your bank account, when you're done and you log out, close the browser before moving on to the next thing you want to do, like logging into your email. So 
setting your browser to automatically clear your cache cookies and history is only going to work if you actually close your browser between each activity you do on the internet. The other information that's going to be in this um, link is how to set up all the security settings in both Mozilla Firefox and Google Chrome. So it's not just automatic setting, um, automatically clearing the the history and the cookies and the cache. You're going to get all kinds of information about how to set up the security settings that are available to you. So how do you recognize the common scams? Um, well, they're usually trying to scare you into clicking a link or giving you them information. They may promise you free money. They may offer a very low price product or service, or they may ask you for help like, hey, um, your cousin and I really need a lot of money or remember the old one, the Nigerian prince um, or the New Orleans flood. Remember people were, the scammers were asking for money. They used to commonly contain one or more misspellings or bad grammar. Um, they still do a lot of them, but some of them now are pretty good with the spelling and the grammar. So don't count on that. So there are different types of scams and one is called phishing. And phishing is imitating a company's branding in emails, websites. So it could be a website that looks a lot like PayPal, but it's not, as well as ads that might pop up or be on other websites. And these are created with the intent to trick you into divulging your password, your credit card, and other personal information, and or clicking on a link that downloads malware onto your device. So shown here is a fisherman and an example email I received recently that was trying to imitate PayPal. And what I thought was fascinating is at the bottom of the email, you even say, it even says PayPal is committed to preventing fraudulent emails. Emails from PayPal will always contain your full name. I mean, that, that's brilliant. I'm going to show you some more examples of phishing in the next few slides. So fishermen can imitate government agencies like the FBI and IRS. Popular companies like Adobe Reader and Bank of America, as well as your friends and family who ask you for money. Here's an example that I received from um, Amazon. It looks like Amazon's logo, um, all the right coloring. It even has a picture of this book that I didn't buy. I mean, that's very sophisticated. And you see on the right hand side, it's um, spam um, trying to imitate Microsoft Office 365, which looks really good. And there's no grammatical errors. You can see here an email that I received from QuickBooks and I've been getting those a lot. Now, first thing is I never purchased QuickBooks Desktop Pro. That's a giveaway. Second, I know it's not that expensive because we did get a lower version of it and I know um, what the higher version costs. And then of course, it's really obvious it's coming from Russia and that's not a valid uh, email for QuickBooks. So if you get an email from someone who wants you to respond or click on a link or alarms you or asks you for help, Check if this is a company you really work with, like your bank or a product you really own or purchased. Do not click on links or call any phone numbers that are in the email. Do not reply to the sender. Do not trust the information in the email. Simply find the company phone number or email address in a print or online directory that's you readily available and contact them to ask if the request is real or not. I've done that multiple times over the past years. And usually when you call the company, they'll say, no, that's spam. Hey, can you forward me that email? 
So clicking on links in emails or on websites may download malware onto your device that collects information about you, such as your password, your bank account numbers, or other personal information. Another thing that could happen is it inactivates your device or holds it for ransom. This happened to a close friend of mine and it was really scary. I don't advise downloading photos or other email attachments. If they are from someone you know, um, and you can scan the attachment with anti-malware software before downloading, that makes it a lot safer. Now in the past, you could hover over the email address um, from the sender of the email, and you would see that the real email was coming from a nefarious source. Scammers have figured out how to disguise themselves better, so this no longer works. Nowadays, phishing emails are much more sophisticated, as you saw, and don't even have spelling or grammatical errors. If you do get an email that is not from someone you know or from a company that you recognize, you can check these three websites, Snopes, Bank of America, and Experian, to see if they are already listed as a scam. There is one more thing I recommend if you haven't already done so. This is to use the spam filters you have with your email service provider. And if you receive emails that are spam that have gotten through these filters, mark them as spam. So you can see here in Gmail, there's that little stop sign exclamation point. That's you click on the box, like I clicked on the Gmail team and click on that exclamation point and that'll mark it as spam in Gmail and Yahoo. There's just click on the box and then click on that spam button. So you mark the emails as spam and then it's important to delete them. So I want to mention the importance of creating secure passwords for online banking and things like PayPal accounts, credit cards, and other sites that have your most sensitive information. So first of all, do not use the same passwords for all of your accounts, because if one is hacked, then the hacker will likely try this password for all your accounts. You want to create strong passwords. Well, what does that mean? So this table really highlights how much time it takes for a hacker to crack your password with current technologies. Obviously, technologies will improve and make things faster, but right now, as of, I think it was 2021, these are the speeds. So you can see that you want at least 10 characters in a password. You want it to include numbers, upper and lowercase letters, and symbols. Nowadays, most sites limit the kind of symbols you can use because some symbols are used by hackers to inject code into websites. So just make sure you read the instructions if they give you them on which symbols are allowed. Last but not least, store your passwords in a safe place and preferably not on your computer that could get hacked. So next we'll cover security software and other helpful resources. So when choosing anti-malware software, choose a reputable company. Just like all your other apps and your operating system, keep the software updated. You want to set automated full scans once per day and use a complimentary anti-malware software to scan once per week. So this link I have on this page is from a reputable source and compares anti-malware software. And then I've given you two examples of free high quality software that we use, um, Microsoft Defender that comes with Windows um, 
devices and then malware bytes. They both have really good reputations. Um, there is a paid version of malware bytes. Um, don't have to get the paid version. That is completely at your discretion. So lastly, let's discuss the importance of backing up your system and data. So your data is precious. You have your former tax filings, important Word documents, spreadsheets, PDFs, and then sentimental things like photos and videos. You don't want to lose them. Malware can block access to your data or your entire computer or even delete your data. Now, being that pricing has dropped significantly for both small thumb drives and large external hard drives that are needed to store it, like large images and videos, and they store so much more data, there's really no excuse not to back up your data. Now, I'm a little obsessive. I have backups of things on two thumb drives as well as two hard drives. So I have a two ter one terabyte drives and then I have two like 256 gigabyte thumb drives. But I definitely advise backing up on at least two drives because what my experience was the drives don't last forever. And so if you have two, one might break down and you, you back, you check your backups and you realize it's not available to you anymore. That means you have a second backup just in case. So to back up your system, we're talking your operating system and, and settings. If you lose that, it's a big pain to set that back up again. It takes a lot of time, especially the settings. If you set up your, for instance, Word and email settings um, on Outlook and, and just setting up the operating system to the latest um, and greatest versions, that takes a lot of time. So I highly recommend you create restore points. And again, creating at least one restore point. So what is a restore point? It's a backup copy of important operating system files and settings from a point in time when your computer was not compromised. So this copy can be used to recover the system. Backing up your files does not back up your system files and settings. So this is complementary to backing up your files on the thumb drives or the larger external drives. Windows operating system now makes you manually create restore points. So this slide has a link to a video that shows you how to do it in Windows 10. And then I also included a link to a video of how to set this up with an Apple device. So in summary, you should update your system and software regularly, preferably set up an automatic updates. Secure your browser. And again, we've got that link to the video I created just for you. That's step-by-step -step on how to do that with Firefox and Chrome. When you're online, don't be in a rush. Be cautious what emails you open and what links you click and what you download. Use free or paid anti-malware software and scan your device every day. Back up your system once, get, make that restore point, and your data whenever there's new data. So for instance, whenever I create some new files on my computer, um, before I even leave the computer to go get lunch or take a break, I will put in my little external thumb drive, back up those files. And that way, for some reason, if something happens and all that work, precious work would be lost, I've got that backup if the computer dies.